So these are my African cichlids. Uh, some of them are known as either electric yellows or yellow labs. They do have this nice dark black uh, marking on their um, dorsal fin and their um, pectoral fins, but you can't really see them because they're stressed. But I wanted to film them as a last goodbye because I am going to be selling them at the Greater Chicago Cichlid Association since I don't have a tank right now that is big enough for them that will give them the adequate space. This is a male and this is actually his two daughters. They're females so they're going to be going to a much better home and in the future I would like to have more African cichlids but for now the best thing is to rehome these guys and I wanted to kind of film them so I can say bye. I do get attached to all my fish so it's kind of hard for me to let go of them but all of the hobbyists at the Greater Chicago Cichlid Association are very experienced and very knowledgeable and take very good care of their fish so I know that whoever gets these guys will take awesome care of them. This is totally my filming setup right here. I have my little butt pillow and I got my coffee <laughs> right here. That's how we're going to film on the floor today. So hi guys and welcome to Fishy Fan Friday vlog. It is a video where I just show you my fish and just talk to you guys and just let you enjoy looking at my little fishies. And I have a little sneak peek. Something secret and awesome is happening over here. So let's jump right into it and check this out. So I wasn't planning on getting any tanks. But uh, when I went to Petco with my boyfriend, we saw that they had the, the dollar per gallon sale. And when they have that every, not every, not the big tanks, but on the smaller tanks, they cost a dollar per gallon. So this 20 gallon long was only $20 and Daniel got it for me. Um, I was actually going to raise the babies <coughs> in here, these two tubs. Um, but now what I did is let me sit on my designated, there we go, my floor throne of fish filming. Um... So this is a 40 quart or 38 liter tub, and this is what they kind of look like. I know a lot of you guys were asking about them. I have two of these, and I had my African cichlids in one of these, and I had my baby bettas in the other. And uh, I was going to use both of them. I was going to split my baby bettas into two tubs. And they're roughly about 10 gallons. Let um, me get comfy. There we go. So uh, this would have been a good situation for me because you know later on if I have to move or take down these containers you know I can just stack them and they won't take up room versus a tank but uh, this is so much nicer in a sense that um, I could film these guys because one of the big important things about breeding these baby bettas is a you know I wanted to experience baby breeding uh, for betta fish particularly. I've bred other fish before in the past but never bettas. So I wasn't really planning on becoming a betta breeder per se but I wanted to experience it at least just once and what I wanted to do is I wanted to just document the entire process so you guys can kind of see it. It's a little sneak peek into the life of bettas. So for those of you that have adult bettas you can kind of see the part that you don't see before you get your fish. So when your fish are bred, whether it's bred on a fish farm or from a breeder, you don't really get to see this stage of your bettas. So I wanted to share that with you guys. And I also wanted to show some of some people that are interested in breeding, you know, how as a first timer I'm going through this. So as I make uh, good decisions and bad decisions, you guys can learn from them. And, you know, what works for me can hopefully work for you. What doesn't work for me, you can probably try to avoid to save you the headache or, you know, waste money on things that don't work. By the way, this is Malaysian coffee. It's a white coffee. It's, uh, the brand is Old Town, I believe. It's really good. Yummy stuff. So, I thought that for documenting the growth of the baby bettas, this 20 gallon long would be good. Ideally, I wish I could have gotten a 40-gallon breeder tank, 
Uh, that one unfortunately wasn't under the sale. The biggest tank they had was a 29 gallon and um, this these containers, these racks that I have, um, they do extend a lot higher but I don't have the room because of my ceiling. So I can't really fit a 29 gallon tank. Also the other thing I was concerned about is bettas don't really like a tall water column. They prefer a longer tank so this is technically a little better for them in terms of um, it's easier to get to the top. Even for the piggy betta who's still chubby. He's the only one that always pigs out. And then he gets so fat that he can't really swim very well. But he, he when he's not full of eating, full of eating, full of food, he can swim. I just right now I fed them some beef heart and all of them, you know, ate a normal amount. Except Piggy Pit McPiggerson's over here. As always, I've been putting him in baby bed of jail. And what that is, um, is I have these cups right here. Because I've been trying to get some cups so I can figure out what kind of system I'm going to have to separate these baby bettas once they're too big and, you know, fighting with each other before I sell them. So I've been trying out different cups just to see and prepare. And what I do is I'll catch him and I'll float this cup in here and... When I feed the other ones, he'll be in little baby betta jail, and I'll give him his own little tiny piece of food, or what he should eat, but he can't eat the rest of the food that the other ones are eating because he overeats, so that's kind of how I've been managing the little greedy baby. I have a couple other greedy babies, but they're they're manageable, so they'll eat a large amount as Fry would, because Fry, you know, they try to eat as much as possible. Let me try to reposition myself. But, they, you know, it doesn't affect them like the piggy baby over here. So, he's my little, he's a trouble child of the bunch. Uh, so, the babies are still changing colors. If you can see, this baby right here is a good example of how bettas look like little koi babies look when they're changing. They kind of turn from the darker colors. They start to get splotchy. That one's doing it too. And then they progressively get lighter, and eventually that one's getting ch changing too. And then eventually they change into these white babies. And then once they turn white, hopefully within a few months they're going to start developing patterns on them. So hopefully we're going to see some koi patterns, which should be very exciting. Um, one of the things that makes me really sad is I do have two babies that might have to be culls. Um, they're somewhere over there. They always hide. Um, I think one of them is right here, actually. I have two little runts. Yeah, there, there's one of them. I'm actually not going to zoom in to show you because what I'm going to show you, it's, he's so pitiful. When he can't swim. And when I look at him, it breaks my heart. And when I show him to you, you're, I'm going to make so many people sad. Um... So I have, a, I have a bunch of runts in here, but a lot of the smaller ones are actually doing really well, even though they're little. But yeah, one example is right here. That's a super tiny baby. And that one's doing really well. He's looking for food and, you know, on a quest to find things to nibble on. And I've been still feeding them baby brine shrimp once a day. I need to start my hatchery after this video, but I just want really loud bubbling. So, oh, that one has some food he found. He's just going to swim with it. You're so cute. Oh, little baby bettas. So, I've been feeding them a variety of foods, predominantly frozen or live foods. And then once a day, they get baby brime shrimp. And the reason I'm still feeding them baby brime shrimp is some of the little ones are too little to eat the food that the big ones eat. <coughs> so the big ones are already starting to eat beef heart, frozen beef heart, which is actually uh, fish food. You'd think when you hear beef heart, why would you feed that to your fish? But it's actually food you feed your fry that really helps accelerate growth. And it's very good for fish that like to be carnivorous. Oh my gosh, that baby is so bad. He's just swimming around with his food. And that's actually some of the beef heart right there. They're gonna, they keep breaking it apart into smaller pieces and then sometimes they get greedy and start swimming around with it. Um, until they spit it out because then they, they realize they can't swallow the whole thing. And see, there we go. He dropped it. And he's going to nibble out it again, try to break it apart. But 
that's kind of what they've been doing but because I want the little ones to eat too I'm trying to give them a variety now I could have kept them separate I did separate the babies at first the smaller ones so I could feed them separately but at the moment my tank upstairs is actually utilized by two new fish and um, that might be contributing to my breeding project if I continue to breed and I'm actually not going to show them to you yet because it's a surprise. Um, but uh, I think I should be able to grow them out all together besides the little ones. The little ones, I feel, the two that I mentioned, they can't swim and they're super skinny. Which I've tried to put, I've tried an experiment where I, I caught them and I put them in a cup and I put them put some baby sh by brine shrimp with them so it's, I made it super easy for them to eat and they still could barely eat so there is some sort of like besides the problem of underdevelopment in their body they also can't properly fully eat so at this point the most humane thing would be to euthanize them instead of trying to raise them up because they're pretty much just gonna they're super skinny and they're just gonna starve to death because physically they're just not developed enough to eat. What I use for euthanizing fish, and you can buy this on Amazon or anywhere else, this is 100% clove oil. Uh, let me there, zoom in, there we go. You put in, you, you, some people use it to, to um, anesthetize fish, but if you put a lot of it in water and then shake it up to mix the oil with the water and put your fish in right away, it will very, very, very quickly kill your fish humanely. So. Um, that's one way to do it. If you're doing this, then you can't feed the babies to any other fish. If some people will have predatory um, animals. They'll have either predatory fish or axolotls or any other big critters that they feed babies to. Which to some people sounds probably really terrifying and awful. But when you have when you're breeding a lot of fish and then you have babies that you know are, are really deformed and not are not gonna make it because it happens when you breed a lot of fish there's always gonna be that couple that aren't doing well um, when you feed them to another fish uh, first of all that's also another quick death but it's also good use uh, like their body doesn't go to waste you know the food chain the circle of life kind of continues so that's kind of why a lot of breeders have predatory fish or other critters. I don't. Uh, I had my African cichlids, but I actually sold them at the Greater Chicago Cichlid Association. Well, I didn't sell them. I donated them to the club, and then they were uh, sold to a gentleman who actually has a 120-gallon tank that they're going to go in with other African cichlids. So they're going to go to really great homes. I'm really happy. So, um, but besides that, you know, culling fish, it, it's a hard topic to talk about, but it's part of breeding. And I know it's kind of shocking to a lot of average pet owners, but if you're a breeder and you breed really large quantities of fish, it, it's going to happen whether you like it or not. And um, while thinking that we can save every little baby fish sounds like the best thing to do, realistically when you have so many babies sometimes you know it, it, it's not the best I mean you want to save them all and you care and you get really attached but you can't luckily this only happened to two babies and they're all hiding over there because um, they're they don't want to get picked on by the larger babies and when I when I do have to call them that's not something I'm gonna film because that's not something um, for you know everyone's enjoyment or anything so that you know that's something I'll mention but I won't even show you the babies because when I look at them I get really sad so I don't want to upset you guys oh once the fat baby's flaring at, at this one so but it's something if you're gonna breed bettas it's something you have to know about um and something you're gonna have to encounter and it's really hard and if you can't make that decision you know, to make what to make the choice to do what's best for a little fish, 
versus letting it naturally die a slow death because it can't function properly, then you shouldn't, you know, breeding bettas might not be uh, a thing for you. And it's really tough. It's not something people do willy-nilly. Um, and this topic got really sad and really dark really fast. But I mentioned it in, you know, a previous video and a lot of people um, got surprised and upset and I wanted to mention it again and maybe explain it a little better. That, you know, it's it's what happens when you're in the fish keeping hobby. So, on that sad note, I have more sad news. So, the female that was here didn't make it. Um, she died this morning. And I actually have her on a spoon right here. So if you don't want to see her, a dead fish, look away now. I'll tell you when to look back. But this is what she looks like. And I wanted to show you guys because uh, maybe someone might be able to identify or notice something about her. She actually looks completely fine and healthy to me. So I don't know why she died. It's one of the first times that... Oh, by the way, you can look back now. It's one of the first times that I've lost a fish and it's completely 100% mystery. Um, it must be something internal. All the other fish in the tank that she was in are doing really well. They're really healthy. So I have no clue. Um, I did think about it and I did... Now I, that I think about it, I recall that she did... When I put her back in the 20 gallon long tank from the container I had her with the other females... She did spend some time in the back of the tank, like, swimming around and hiding. I thought that she was just exploring. But I think there was something wrong with her. So it's, it was something that was more long-term. And, um, you know, maybe if I noticed earlier, I would be able to fix it. I am going to be looking into getting a book about fish diseases. I've been looking at Amazon at different books. Oh, look at that greedy baby just ate that huge piece. Oh my gosh. This guy. You're so bad. There's another really fun thing about me just talking to you guys, but filming the babies. is because you can actually see what they do just on a normal average day. I actually spend every day just sitting here and looking at them. And I like to observe them and watch them, you know, do their little fishy things. It lets me kind of get to know them a little better. And I practice telling them apart. I practice noticing different things about them. But anyways, back to my... Before I get distracted. Um, so I want to get a book on fish diseases. So I can better learn about um, distinguishing and noticing different fish diseases. Uh, before, I just knew the, you know, basic, really easy to spot ones. Like ick, for example. And I've treated ick before and that was no problem. Um... I couldn't successfully treat dropsy, but not a lot of people can. And I haven't really had other big problems. So as I am getting deeper into the fish keeping hobby, I have to learn more about diseases and being able to recognize different diseases and have different treatments for them. So I'm going to be definitely looking into getting a book so I can learn up a lot more. Um, there's two different books I'm interested in. One is, I forgot the name, but it's by a very well-known better breeder. Um, so I can learn more about the genetics and better breeding and uh, more insight to that. And then there's one about just general fish diseases. So when that happens, hopefully I'll learn more so I can pass the information on to you guys. But that's definitely not my strong point. Um... I always get really sad when I get comments on my channel about uh, people asking for advice about their fish getting sick because a lot of the time I actually don't really know what it is, especially if I can't really see the fish and I'm going off just, you know, some very little information on a, on a YouTube comment. I can't diagnose your fish. I'm not a vet. So hopefully... I'll be able to learn more and pass along this information so you guys can learn more, I can learn more, and we can better take care of our fish. Let's see. Um, another interesting thing. By the way, today is just going to be a chill day where I'm just going to sit here and keep shifting because it's a little hard to sit in one spot for too long. But I'm just going to, you know, not really film the other tanks. 
I'm just gonna focus on the baby so you could just enjoy watching them do their normal behaviors and kind of experience something I get to every single day but anyways I did have a problem with properly heating this tank um, because I want it to be over 80 degrees I ideally I would like to keep it at 84 that um, I started looking online and you know in a lot of places it says for fry you should keep them at 80 degrees but then I found some websites from breeders in Asia that have been successful in growing out their fry very quickly and they say the the good range of temperature is actually 84 to 88 and it makes sense because you know it speeds up their metabolism they could digest food faster they can grow so I've been trying to keep my tank a little warmer as you can see I have my little thermometer let me see if it updates yeah so I have this right here it's it's um, a digital temp thermometer and it hooks up to right here that little thing right here and that measures the temperature and I can have it kind of in the middle and it says 82.4 so I have it close to what I would like ideally but unfortunately I'm using two heaters I have one heater here which is very visible and then I have another heater inside the jar and I put it inside the jar so it's a little less um it's a little hidden so the tank looks a little more visually appealing and uh so yeah i've been running two heaters which is working for now but i'm gonna have to be very careful and monitor my fish because my place that i live in right now is an attic space and it's not insulated so it gets cold really fast but when it gets sunny it gets hot really fast so in a few weeks from now it's going to get really hot up here, like average of maybe 85 degrees. So at that point, I'm going to need to make sure I turn off my heaters or set them on low so I can turn on at night if needed. But I don't want them to get too hot because then, you know, the tanks are going <clears> to <throat> heat up with the, with the air. And I've noticed sometimes as heaters are not really the most reliable things in the world. Um, sometimes you'll have a heater that you set to a certain temperature, but then it gets really warm um, in the room, and then but the t heater still keeps working, and then you end up having a really warmer than needed um, tank water. So that's something I'm going to have to be monitoring. I'm also going to be gone for a week at the end of this month. I'm going to a dog training retreat, which should be really fun. And then next month I have a trip in Colorado. So during the dog training retreat, I'm going to be leaving the baby battles with Daniel. He's going to be taking care of them, and hopefully he'll do well. And then during the Colorado retreat, my dad's going to be coming in to take care of the babies. So it's it's going to be interesting trying to figure out directions and what kind of instructions and how to prepare uh, these tanks, especially because I think Daniel will be able to do some water changes, but I don't think, I don't know if my dad's going to be able to do water changes on these tanks. Um, so just in case I have to figure out, um, how I can set up this tank, how I, if I can add, um, carbon and some activated carbon and a couple other things and maybe figure out a food feeding regimen that's very light on feeding so then they could they can do well for a week in this um kind of crowded tank so that's something i still have to figure out i also been thinking about how i'm going to start jarring the babies um one idea that i had and I actually have this right next to me so let me get it is i was thinking that for the first few babies that i have um, I was going to use this container right here and then put all these cups and drill holes in the cups and then put a heater and then hook up this bubble filter so then moves the water around so I could have a few babies in here. I probably could fit two more cups so it could be a total of six babies in here and they could have, you know, filtered water that's heated. Um, I probably still would have to do water changes every other day. But, you know, that's one idea. Um, so I don't, I don't really know. Because I wanted to set up something 
that in case some of the babies do get aggressive or something happens, it's very easy for Daniel or my dad to separate them and, you know, have something that's really low maintenance. <sighs> so we'll tackle it as it happens. One thing is if you're thinking about breeding bettas, um, they definitely rely on you being there or at least having someone that's very trustworthy to be able to take care of them. They require a lot of work versus my adult fish. Adult bettas can even be fine without eating for a whole week, you know? You can just leave it alone and they'll be completely, completely fine. But with these babies, they need very regular care. So you need to have a protocol if you breed. You need to know that for the first, you know, month or two, you're going to be home a lot so that um, you can take care of them. And then when you do have to leave, you need to have someone you can trust that will, you know, you can inform enough information <laughs> so they can make good choices and taking care of your babies and accidentally kill all of them. So that's something I've already been thinking and planning ahead of time. Um, what I might be doing is, you know, maybe I'll do a tutorial video. How oh, that baby's kind of posturing in that one he's kind of showing off yeah they're flaring at each other a little bit they're such little butts but that's something you know I've been I've been wondering out maybe if I can put together a video on how to care take care of baby bettas for pet sitters or friends you guys can use it if you need um oh sorry I got distracted I was looking at my uh mail right here I put some endlers in here for a while with him so he can have some variety in his life because he's been getting kind of bored and depressed. So this at least gives him something to chase. But he's acting kind of odd. So I've been thinking about maybe getting some sort of general medicine maybe that would treat internal parasites or something that can gently treat all of my fish just to see in case they have something because I still haven't figured out what my female has so yeah that's a lot of things I've been thinking about and I just realized there's 26 minutes of me talking so I think <sighs> I am going to actually stop talking now and kind of end this video thank you for spending another fishy fan Friday with me I hope that you enjoyed uh, hanging out with me while I drank coffee and looked at baby fish and I hope that you enjoyed uh, looking at all these cute little babies and how they interact with each other and what kind of really wonderful personalities they have. I will be making an update on them soon to kind of film them and highlight um, another month of their growth. So that's going to be out soon. I'm also finishing up my DIY CO2 um, video so I'm doing that as well. So lots of cool stuff in store and of course don't worry guys I'm gonna be doing more uh, cat and bunny and dog videos as well I'm just you know really distracted by all this better cuteness which is why I've been doing a lot of fish videos but still gonna be showing my other pets as well so I hope that you enjoyed this video if you did be sure to give it a thumbs up be sure to subscribe to this channel if you already haven't and tell your friends to subscribe so we can grow our community together. I hope that you have an awesome day and I will see you on